And let's uh, go ahead and get started. I want to welcome everybody to Medicine Grand Rounds this week, and I'm very excited about our speaker today. Um, Dr. Janice Jameson is the James Robert McCord Professor and Chair for the Department of Gynecology and Obstetrics um, here at Emory. Dr. Jameson completed medical school at Duke. She received her MPH from the University of North Carolina, so there had to be some rivalry going on there. And then she completed residency in OBGYN at UCSF um, before joining the CDC, first as an epidemic intelligence service officer. She subsequently stayed, however, at the CDC for 20 years, uh, retiring from the US Public Health Service Corps in 2017, um, when we successfully recruited her here to Emory. While at the CDC, she held multiple leadership positions um, and uh, as the, the final part of her career was the incident manager for the Zika virus response. And in fact, that was fitting since Dr. Jameson's scientific work focuses on emerging infections, infectious diseases and in pregnancy, including in the areas of influenza, Ebola, Zika, and now COVID, as well as maternal immunization. In addition, her work incorporates a population health perspective with projects addressing health disparities and social determinants of health in the context of maternal morbidity and other adverse pregnancy outcomes. So it is fitting also that her clinical work is at Grady. In 2020, she was one of two Emory faculty, both I might mention were women, who were elected as members of the National Academy of Medicine, which is a, a huge accomplishment and uh, very exciting. And in the past year, she has been a, a very, very critical national voice developing guidance and contributing research related to COVID-19 and pregnant women both uh, for those with infection and regarding vaccination. So this is a very um, timely today uh, for us to ask her to talk about that work. Her talk today is entitled Pregnancy in the Time of COVID-19. And I um, very much thank you for joining us and look forward to hearing your discussion. Thanks so much for the really kind and generous introduction and thanks for the opportunity to present today. And I will see if I can get my slides to work. Can you see the full um, slide presentation view? Not yet. Hmm. Uh, Now, I think if you go into slideshow, you'll have it. How about that? That looks perfect. Okay, good. That's the first test. <laughs> um, so thanks again uh, for the opportunity to talk about pregnancy in the time of COVID. I set this, oh, and I want to go back and just say that um, since the very beginning of the um, pandemic, I've been working very closely with Sonia Rasmussen, a dear friend and colleague of many decades. We worked together at the CDC. And so really all of what I'm presenting today reflects our joint thinking um, that has evolved um, in the last, I don't know, 11 months or so, probably close to a year now. So I've set this up as a series of questions that, um, and sort of how I think about most pregnancy pathogens in pregnancy. And the first is, are pregnant persons more likely um, to get infected with SARS-CoV-2? So are they more susceptible? And there have been um, quite a few um, studies looking at universal screening of pregnant persons because we started doing that fairly early on in the pandemic. Um, and you can see the estimates vary greatly, whether you're symptomatic or asymptomatic, where you are um, and when in the pandemic you are. So the estimates range um, uh, quite widely. There have also been some seroprevalence studies of laboring patients. Um, also showing a range of uh, seroprevalence uh, depending on you know, when and where you're tested. But in terms of actual susceptibility, it remains unknown whether pregnancy increases your susceptibility to COVID-19. And why is that? Because we don't have appropriate comparison groups. We would really need non-pregnant women of childbearing age with similar levels of exposure. So same place, same time, um, and we just are not we don't have that type of universal testing that we're doing for patients who present to labor and delivery. 
Next question is how do race, ethnicity, and other factors affect SARS-CoV-2 infection in pregnant persons? Um, and that turns out to be fairly interesting. There was a study out of New York City which showed that um, infection among pregnant persons is less likely if you, you know, have higher median household, uh, you live in an area with higher mean assessed residential values, and infection is more likely um, if you live in areas with high unemployment rates, um, more crowd, household crowding, and so forth. So um, not dissimilar from what you find in non-pregnant persons. We did a study at Grady, one of the um, fellows, Naima Joseph, um, she's a maternal fetal medicine fellow, did a nice study looking at our um, population of women presenting um, both at Grady and Midtown. And you can see, in, not surprisingly, um, but interestingly, given that these hospitals, as we know, are you know, less than a mile away, the infection rate was 9.4% at Grady and 1.5% at Midtown um, in spring and summer. And infection was significantly associated with Hispanic ethnicity, uninsured status, high neighborhood density. Um, this one was unexpected, smaller household size. But in general, with that exception, you know, perhaps what you would have predicted. The next question comes up after people want to know about susceptibility. They often want to know about severity. Are pregnant persons with COVID at increased risk of severe disease? And after some delay in gathering this information, um, and there were some early case series. There was a WHO report that really had trouble sorting out whether or not um, pregnancy was a risk factor for severe disease, the way it is with influenza and other pathogens. But I think we now have fairly compelling data that um, pregnant uh, pregnancy status does put you at increased risk for severe disease. So I think these are the best data from the um, uh, case surveillance data collected at the CDC. As you can see, um, comparing 24,000 uh, pregnant persons with uh, 386,000 non-pregnant persons, um, pregnant persons were more likely to require ICU admission, more likely to be mechanically ventilated, to require ECMO, and to die. And this held true um, when adjusted for age, race, ethnicity, and medical condition. So I think based on this and some other um, information, we can now say that pregnant women are uh, at risk for more severe disease. And that's why they're included in the tier 1C for vaccination. They're included, pregnancy is included um, by the CDC as a medical condition that increases your risk of severe disease. Wanted to mention this. This is a nice um, surveillance study that was set up in the United Kingdom. They did what we should have done in the US and that is they developed a surveillance system for novel pathogens um, for pregnant patients prior to the pandemic. So they designed it in 2012 and then they didn't use it and they activated it um, during COVID. Um, and so they had a nice opportunity to collect um, good data fairly quickly. And they found that the same risk factors among non-pregnant patients held for pregnant patients, um, including age and overweight obesity. This was a study, um, this is a, a project um, that was designed fairly early in the pandemic to collect information about pregnant and recently pregnant um, persons um, organized out of UCSF. Um, it's a nationwide prospective cohort study of pregnant persons in the US and it follows them out to, um, they can be enrolled out to six weeks. The novel thing about this study is that um, there's a lot of outpatient follow-up. So the, the participants are called weekly for a series for up to eight weeks. And um, this uh, paper reports that 25% of symptomatic participants who were positive had persistent symptoms eight or more weeks after symptom onset. So again, um, suggested uh, that these symptoms um, can last. So after you talk about susceptibility and severity, the next question that often comes up, well, how does this affect the pregnancy? And if you think about how infections can infect, affect pregnancy, 
um, there can be direct effects of the pathogen. And that's what we saw, for example, with Zika, that you had this congenital Zika virus um, syndrome um, because there was intrauterine transmission um, resulting in these congenital abnormalities. But there can also be secondary effects on the embryo or fetus um, due to maternal illness. So when the mother's ill, um, oftentimes the fetus or baby does not do well. So we knew this from uh, 2009 H1 influenza um, that severely ill women were more likely to have deliver preterm infants, infants with low birth weight and infants with low AFGAR scores. Um, so not surprising. The interesting thing about influenza that people don't realize is that um, you don't get much transmission at all, but intrauterine transmission has been documented even with influenza. And we'll come back to that in terms of COVID, SARS-CoV-2. So if you look at preterm birth with COVID, um, the studies are a little bit inconsistent. Um, some show an increased risk, some don't show a significantly increased risk of preterm birth among uh, women with COVID. But if you look at them in total, um, as this nicely done systematic review um, showed a threefold increased risk of preterm birth among those who are COVID positive. So um, not surprisingly, infection, particularly severe infection, increases the risk that a woman will deliver a preterm um, infant. The association with stillbirth is a little less clear. Uh, stillbirth is really hard to study for a variety of reasons, um, most notably because it's a rare outcome. There were two studies from the UK that suggested that there might be an increase in stillbirth associated with COVID infection. Um, this first one, the night study was from that UK surveillance system that I mentioned, and they showed um, the stillbirth rate was 12 per 1000 in COVID infected um, patients um, compared to a national rate of four to five. Um, Khalil then looked at one hospital in the UK and compared um, stillbirths during the pandemic versus prior to the pandemic and found an increase. Several other studies have looked just at um, the rate of stillbirth during the pandemic versus pre-pandemic and did not show an increase. But again, this doesn't really answer the question. This is um, a really interesting observation. Um, in the field of obstetrics, the causes of preterm birth have been elusive for decades. We can't figure out um, what causes preterm birth and we're terrible at uh, preventing preterm birth despite a lot of research um, and interest over many years. Um, and so people were really surprised that this pattern of an overall decrease in preterm births during COVID lockdowns um, were noted in multiple countries, Ireland, Denmark, Netherlands, Japan, all found marked decreases in particularly extreme prematurity um, during the pandemic compared with before the pandemic. And authors hypothesized that perhaps this was due to decreased stress, you know, fam more family support, avoiding other infections during lockdowns, um, sleep or nutritional improvements, decreased exposure to air pollutants, you know, avoidance of financial strain, which, you know, is a much different picture than in our country. Um, and notably, these same decreases in um, uh, uh, preterm birth were not noted in the U.S., two hospitals in Philadelphia, or in Sweden. And interestingly, both U.S. and Sweden, you could argue, may not have implemented full nationwide lockdowns in the same way as other countries. So I'm not sure what this means. <clears throat> but it's a really interesting um, sort of global natural experiment. Um, and I wonder whether it could hold clues to helping us better understand and prevent preterm birth. So the next question that comes up is, is there transmission from the mother to the fetus, um, intrauterine, interpartum or postnatal through breastfeeding transmission? So there were, have been various, uh, determining intrauterine transmission for a lot of pathogens is also often a bit tricky. And so early on, there were several um, criteria, sets of criteria that were developed to define intrauterine transmission, what you needed to be able to say, yes, 
transmission occurred from mother to fetus or baby. I think the Blumberg criteria um, uh, is perhaps the um, best or one of the best um, uh, methods. It, it requires that the mother is positive around birth. It requires early exposure, and then it requires persistence. Um, wanted to note that the WHO did hold a consultation on mother to child transmission um, back in December um, that I uh, was lucky enough to be a part of. And um, the criteria from that consultation will be published soon. Um, um, and all I will say about that is that it's complicated. But I think there are now a number of cases that are probable um, intrauterine transmission. This is one of the best cases. The you know mom was positive. She had a cesarean delivery with intact membranes. The amniotic fluid was positive. The placenta was positive. The neonate was immediately isolate, intubated and isolated at birth, so no contact with the um, mother. Um, lavage br uh, bronco bronchoalveolar lavage fluid was PCR positive, nasopharyngeal and rectal swabs were positive. Um, the baby, uh, and the, the swabs were positive out to 18 days, so prolonged um, um, positivity. The baby developed symptoms. Um, and so I think this is a, a one of several cases that demonstrates that yes, intrauterine transmission can occur. Although it occurs, it appears to be rare. Um, and there's been, there have been a number of papers um, um, sort of laying out uh, why it may be rare. And some of this information has relevance to um, maternal vaccination as well. So it may be related to the fact that there's lower expression of the ACE2 receptor and the serine protein required for SARS-CoV-2 cell entry. And there were two papers showing this. The EDLO paper also showed low levels of maternal viremia. Um, and this really contrasts with other viral pathogens such as Zika and CMV, in which viral receptors are very highly expressed in the placenta. Um, there's also been some work by Edlo and others showing um, that the maternal antibodies are inefficiently transferred to the fetus um, when compared to vaccine-induced influenza antibodies. So when we vaccinate a mother against influenza, it also provides benefit to the newborn infant, which is really important because the infant um, doesn't have the opportunity to be immunized until about six months. Um, however, this same group um, just published a paper in Cell um, that suggests that there may be compensatory mechanisms in the third uh, trimester that allow the placenta to select functionally um, optimized antibodies. So, um, and this is, these are all fairly new papers. What about breast milk? Can um, um, SARS-CoV-2 be transmitted in breast milk? Um, this was a concerning case that occurred relatively early. Well, I guess it was published in May of 2020. Um, this was a mother with mild symptoms. She breastfed wearing a surgical mask with careful hand and breast hygiene. The, her milk was tested seven times. It was PCR positive on four consecutive days. The baby developed symptoms and tested positive. Now, it's very hard, you can't, it's very hard to sort out whether this was through breast milk or through close contact with the mother, but it raised concerns about the safety of breastfeeding and um, breast milk. The good news is there's some reassuring data since then. Um, there have been numerous papers with, um, that have tested for breast milk with negative results. For example, there's this case series of 18 um, persons, 64 samples. Um, there was one that was PCR positive, but no replication competent virus was detected. Even more reassuring was this observational cohort of breastfeeding mothers. All mothers breastfed, they used surgical mask, um, hand hygiene and breast cleansing whenever they handled their infant or held their infant. The um, infants were roomed in with the mothers in a closed isolate and all uh, neonates were negative. That is why we do not recommend separating um, mother and infant and why we promote um, the benefits of breastfeeding 
um, and feel that the risks are, uh, are uh, outweighed by the benefits. So the last question that is obviously now coming up um, frequently is can pregnant persons receive the um, mRNA vaccines? So I wanted to review the process um, by which the vaccines reach the pregnant persons. And many of you may know how this process occurs. Um, but the first step in the process was the um, Data um, and Safety Monitoring Board, which is com comprised of independent scientists, review the phase three trials. An EUA um, or emergency use authorization is then submitted to the FDA. Um, and uh, the um, FDA has the authority um, to allow medical products to be used in a public health emergency. Um, and in this case, the FDA actually set higher standards for COVID-19 vaccines because they were going to be used on a very large population. A lot of times EUAs are for very select small uh, populations. The next step is that the data that are submitted are reviewed by the career scientists, so the people who work full-time for the FDA. And then this is followed by a review by VRPAC, which is an independent advisory committee to the FDA. After um, the issuance of the EUA, it then goes to the um, uh, ACIP, um, or Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, which I like to think of, you know, VRPAC is to the FDA as ACIP is to CDC. ACIP is an independent advisory committee um, to the CDC. Um, it reviews the EUA and provides recommendations for, you know, how and when the uh, vaccine will be used. So they made recommendations for what populations should be vaccinated. <clears throat> And then professional organizations, um, most notably ACOG, American College of OBGYNs, um, provides guidance to practitioners about um, how to um, uh, vaccinate. So most practicing obstetricians um, don't necessarily read ACIP or even CDC documents. They look towards ACOG for guidance about what they're doing and ACOG, um, in almost all circumstances will align with CDC. So these last, I was involved in these last two processes um, as a member of the ACIP working group on COVID vaccine, and then as a member of ACOG's um, working group on COVID-19. And it was really a very interesting process in that I really didn't know up until the morning um, of the ACIP meeting uh, which way it was going to go, whether pregnant women were going to be included or not. Um, and I think uh, uh, the, the correct decision was made. So what do we know about mRNA vaccines in pregnancy? And candidly, there's, you know, there's a lot that we don't know. So we now have DART studies, which are the RAT studies that are done, the developmental and reproductive toxicology um, studies. Um, and we have reassuring data from both Pfizer and Moderna on, on the rodent studies. We have a very small number of pregnant persons who were inadvertently enrolled in the clinical trials. So 23 in the Pfizer trial, 13 in the Moderna, and about half of each of those um, actually received the active vaccine. Um, and most of these women, many of these women are still pregnant. I'm hopeful that there will be clinical trials soon enrolling pregnant persons. Um, we know more about some of the other um, vaccine platforms like the adenoviruses. We have more information um, in pregnancy. For example, the adenovirus, Janssen's uh, adenovirus um, uh, platform was used uh, for Ebola. And uh, we are collecting information from um, CDC's vSafe system, which is the um, monitoring system you can enroll um, on your, phone, your cell phone uh, when you get immunized. And um, vSafe has a pregnancy um, module. Um, CDC has not released the data yet, um, but has said publicly that they have, um, I think close to 15,000 pregnant women who have now been immunized and enrolled in VSAFE. So I hope to see safety data from that soon. 
So what are the ACOG recommendations about COVID um, mRNA vaccine in pregnancy? First of all, um, people who are recommended to receive COVID-19 vaccine should be offered the vaccine regardless of pregnancy status. So if you're a healthcare worker um, and uh, the vaccine is now recommended, um, the recommendation is um, regardless of pregnancy status, you should receive the vaccine. Pregnant persons should be encouraged to talk with their obstetric healthcare provider about their vaccination plan, but this should not be a requirement for vaccination. So there are certain um, counties, I've heard that Cobb County is requiring a letter from your obstetrician. Um, that is not in accordance to um, ACOG recommendations. This is really important. Persons planning to become pregnant um, who are recommended to receive the vaccine should be encouraged to complete their vaccination series prior to conception to make sure they're maximally protected prior to pregnancy. So a number of women have reached out and said, you know, I'm planning IVF, should I get vaccinated now or should I wait? Um, I think um, ensuring that your vaccines are up to date, including your COVID vaccine, if you're um, able, um, it, it's a great time to get vaccinated. Then you know you're protected during pregnancy and we know that pregnancy is a time where you're at risk for more severe disease. Pregnancy testing should not um, uh, be a requirement for COVID-19 vaccination. I know it's not here at Emory Healthcare and lactating persons should be offered the vaccine. Um, I won't go into the details, but pregnant and lactating women are often lumped together, um, which is completely inappropriate. The issues are completely separate in lactation and in breastfeeding. And we give um, lactating women live um, MMR vaccine. There's no reason not to give lactating persons mRNA vaccine. Um, following vaccination, since fever is not uncommon, it's important to treat the fever with acetaminophen, just like we treat all fevers in pregnancy. Um, and we do know that fever um, in the first trimester um, may increase the risk of certain birth defects. Wanted to end with one myth that has been circulating widely. Um, um, I finally was able to figure out where it came from. There's a bo both a nice AP News article as well as a New York Times article. Um, but there was a blog, um, the Health and, I uh, can't find what the name of the blog was, but there was a blog that reported um, that one of the mRNA, that a former Pfizer employee, um, disgruntled employee, um, said that um, Pfizer's vaccine trained the female body to attack syncytion one, which is a protein that's important in the placental development. Um, as we know, mRNA vaccines contains genetic inf information to um, manufacture the spike protein, um, but as it turns out, the syncytion one protein and the spike protein are very unlikely. I like this quote from the New York Times. This um, immunologist said, um, the two proteins share only a minuscule stretch of material. Mixing them up would be akin to mistaking a, a rhinoceros for a jaguar because they're wearing the same collar. Um, so not, uh, not, this is not true, but I have heard it um, from Emory Healthcare staff recently. So in conclusion, um, there are no data on whether pregnancy increases susceptibility to COVID-19. Race, ethnicity, insurance, and neighborhood factors affect whether a pregnant person is infected with SARS-CoV-2. Um, pregnant persons are more likely to have severe disease compared to non-pregnant persons. Um, this comes mostly from the CDC national surveillance data. Um, and the same risk factors um, hold true in pregnant persons compared with non-pregnant persons, um, more common in those who are overweight, obese, or with underlying medical conditions. COVID-19, in terms of effects on the embryo or fetus, there is likely an increased risk of preterm birth. And intrauterine transmission can occur, but appears to be rare. Um, and lastly, pregnant persons can be safely offered the mRNA COVID vaccine. So I think that's my last slide. I'll end there and very happy to take questions.
All right, thank you so much. That was a, a great um, overview of um, what is often a data-free zone right now and uh, looking for expertise for guidance. I think one of the questions, I know you addressed this, but I'm gonna sort of circle back to it. One of the questions I get asked most frequently from women who are pregnant is should they delay vaccination past the first trimester? Again, worried less about the vaccine, but more about the fever and the reaction to the vaccine. And I guess, um, so your thoughts on that, but also, you know, I was interested, you said fever is associated with birth defects. Is that like a single fever? Is that days of fever? Like what, I don't, I'm not familiar with, you know, how intense a fever or what are we talking about for that data? So um, I think, so in terms of what we're talking about for fever, there is, um, there are a number of studies showing that um, fever of any duration it, it can cause an increased risk of birth defects. Obviously birth defects are extremely rare um, event. And so it's still rare. Um, the problem in a lot of the studies is sorting out the fever from the underlying cause of the fever. So it gets quite messy, but in general, you wanna avoid fever in pregnancy. I think it's a complicated, really complicated decision, especially with issues around vaccine access. And if you say you're not gonna take the vaccine today, is it gonna be available tomorrow um, or next month? Um, so I think it's really, a, a, I think it's really important to talk with um, patients about all the factors, how at risk are they, how motiv motivated are they to avoid risk? What's their access to vaccine now? What's their likely access to vaccine in two months or three months? Um, I don't think it's unreasonable to delay in the first trimester. Um, it's interesting because we went through this whole thing with flu vaccine. For many years, we avoided um, flu vaccination in the first trimester. Um, and what we found was it really limited um, that recommendation limited the ability of women to get flu vaccine. They ended up, the rates of flu vaccine were much higher once we said you can get it in any trimester. Um, and we spent a lot of time trying to sort out, you know, were there any increased risk of um, miscarriage in the first trimester? And as it turns out, uh, there don't seem to be increased risk of um, miscarriage. Great, thank you. Dr. Stevens, I see your hand is raised. Uh, th uh, thank you. Uh, really great overview, Denise. We really appreciate uh, not only the overview, but also your leadership in this space. Uh, uh, and uh, thank you for that. I, I, I have a couple of questions. One is about the antibody transfer, which I didn't quite understand. Um, obviously, IgG is produced, IgG1 and IgG3 are produced against the virus. And in pretty early and pretty significantly. I wasn't quite sure why there wasn't, uh, why the transfer didn't occur given those classes are usually transferable. Uh, and the other is a question about long haulers. And uh, do you think pregnancy is uh, at higher risk for long haulers? It may not have been studied and any, any issues regarding the infant as in terms of a long hauler syndrome. Thanks. So regarding the antibodies, I think the bottom line is people are just starting to sort it out. So IgG is generally can be transferred across the placenta. Um, but when these investigators looked, it wasn't as efficiently transferred as for when compared to um, antibodies produced from influenza vaccine. Um, and then when they looked more careful, it seems that certain classes um, uh, uh, of IgG are transferred um, selectively. So I don't, th I, I think the jury's still out. I just, I'm not sure. I think the big, obviously the big issue is what this means for protection of a newborn um, when it's too young to be vaccinated and can't mount a vaccine response. Um, regarding the long haulers, that's, I don't, I mean, the only data I've seen is from the priority study that showed this large proportion of women who um, report symptoms out eight weeks. I haven't seen, although it may exist, comparable data in non-pregnant persons, you know, routine follow-up of outpatient data, of outpatients with COVID um, reporting symptoms. Um, I don't know whether, it's, I, I don't, I don't, 
I'm not sure whether we're going to see um, more, more or less long haulers with women who are infected in pregnancy. Do you have a thought? No, I, I think, uh, you know, the question of other comorbidities, what is, what is causing the long hauler syndrome? Is that virus or is that simply a cytokine reaction, which may be more intense in individuals who are sicker? So maybe because they are sicker in general pregnancy as a risk factor, we might see more of that in, in the, that population. All right, um, so we have a few other questions um, in the chat. Dr. Del Rio, do you wanna unmute and ask your question? Oh, sure, thank you, Wendy. Uh, great, great summary, Denise. I think that's you know, very useful information that we all get asked all the time. One issue that I get also uh, have I been asked is about uh, lactating women. Is there any evidence that antibodies, maternal antibodies after either after disease or after immunization could tra transfer through breast milk and therefore benefit the, the baby? Yes, they do. You do get transfer of maternal antibodies that can, which is one of the reasons why, in general, um, breastfeeding is so beneficial. Um, and so, you, early on, we uh, were concerned about the risks of transmission to the baby. It's something we also worried, thought a lot about during H one N one. Is should the mothers and babies be separated? Um, and uh, luckily, we now have observational data show with, you know, separating a mom and a baby is obviously cruel and unusual. Um, so you don't want to do it unless you have a good reason. And luckily, um, it now looks like babies can be safely um, breastfed. Thank you. Great. Um, other questions in the chat? I don't know um, if uh, Dr. Gomez, if you want to unmute. If not, I can ask your question. All right. Um, uh, he asked, what about high risk pregnancies? Should the mother get vaccinated or not vaccinated? Um, so, it, it, you know, there are reasons why pregnancy can be high risk for either the mother or the baby. I would say for many um, conditions in which the mother, uh, the reason the pregnancy is considered high risk is because the mother has a condition, medical condition it's more important than ever that she be vaccinated. And then I think in terms of conditions in which there's a risk to the baby, um, I think that's this, I don't think the issues are any different. So I would say yes, for high risk pregnancies, you'd wanna vaccinate um, the mother and it may be more important than ever to vaccinate the mother, particularly if she has a, another comorbid condition that increases her risk of um, severe disease. Great. Um, Dr. Spell, do you want to unmute? Uh, sure. Thank you, Dr. Jameson. That was uh, wonderful. Um, I would love to be reminded of the immunological changes that occur during pregnancy and what we know about um, how that affects susceptibility to viral infections and the course of viral infections and whether we know uh, what that might mean for uh, coronavirus. Yeah, so for, you know, many years it was thought that, you know, pregnancy represented in um, uh, uh, immunosuppressed state. And I am by no means an immunologist, but um, you know, that in order not to reject the graft host of a growing fetus, that um, there should be some degree of immunosuppression. And our understanding of um, immunology and pregnancy is much more nuanced now. Um, we believe it represents an immunologic shift with many changes in the immune system but not immunosuppression. And what this really means is that it, it, it varies by um, pathogen. So um, when I think about any new or existing pathogen, I think in terms of is the pregnant, um, is pregnant, are pregnant women more likely more susceptible um, to the pathogen? Do they have more severe disease? Um, and it varies all over the map. Um, I've stopped trying to um, see a pattern. And really, I think you have to take each pathogen separately. Um, unfortunately, because of the, the challenges that I talked about before, there are very few pathogens about which we have good susceptibility data. Um, we have some susceptibility data for influenza and some, uh, because of the, 
the uh, H1N1 pandemic and careful case accounting early on in the pandemic. And for quirky reasons, we have good data on listeria. Um, but for most pathogens, you know, what the immunologic changes of pregnancy will mean in terms of susceptibility and severity, you have to look at each one individually. Um, and sort of as a corollary to that, how about response to vaccination in pregnancy in the immune, in the, that immune milieu? Um, that's a good question there. For most vaccines, um, pregnant women mount an adequate response. So um, there are not vaccines that I know of where that are less effective in pregnancy. All right, so uh, another question um, from a faculty member. Um, curious um, if you could comment on the rate of spontaneous abortions in the vaccine trials. Um, the rates of spontaneous abortions in the vaccine trials. So I am not aware of, um, so the mRNA trials had very few people who were, in, who were it, uh, enrolled because pregnancy was an exclusion criteria. Um, however, like all clinical trials, you always have um, pregnant women inadvertently enrolled, um, or I should say large trials, you often have inadvertently. So I don't know about uh, the stillbirth data. Can whoever ask that unmute? Um, she what can't. She, okay. She can't, can't unmute. Okay. I'm just curious. I don't, I just, I don't know. I mean, it was something we worried a lot about with influenza and there were some early data from CDC that showed an increased risk of, um, well, miscarriage, not stillbirth. She, did she ask about stillbirth? Uh, spontaneous abortion. Spontaneous abortion. Okay. We worried a lot about spontaneous abortion for influenza. Long story, but basically there was a case a flawed case control study that suggested an increased risk of spontaneous abortion, which put everybody in a frenzy because we had been recommending for years that women get vaccinated regardless of trimester. Um, but that data, when analyzed more fully and carefully with a larger data set, it turned out there was not an increased risk of spontaneous abortion. And that's the only uh, vaccination spontaneous abortion data that I know of that initially showed an association and then did not show an association. Okay, that's reassuring. Um, question from Dr. Warkowski. She um, has had several providers inquire passionately, um, and I think many of us have had this experience about using hydroxychloroquine or ivermectin in pregnancy for COVID. Um, wondering if you can comment. Um, hydroxychloroquine is used in pregnancy um, with fairly good safety data, but um, I'm not sure why we're using hydroxychloroquine for COVID. Um, I agree. Okay. Um, so I don't have any other thought. I don't have any specific thoughts on ver ivermectin. I mean, the, the, the overall principle that we always try to follow with pregnant women is that if a pregnant woman is severely ill, you need a really compelling reason not to use the same treatment you'd use in a non-pregnant person. Um, and so, and usually it's the reverse. People think about it, well, I can't use this in pregnancy unless we know it's safe. Well, guess what? We, we have hardly any medications that we use that have been fully tested in pregnancy. Very few that are approved for use in pregnancy. And so as obstetricians, what we have to constantly do is weigh the risks and benefits. But if you've got a severely ill pregnant woman and a therapy or intervention that works, you need a really compelling reason not to use it. Yeah, that makes good sense. Um, any thoughts on whether the risk for more severe clinical disease extends into the postpartum period? And if so, how long? I don't have data on that, but based on what we know about other pathogens, including influenza, you generally don't expect the risk to go back to baseline immediately when the baby's born. So it usually takes a number of weeks. So for example, for antivirals for influenza, um, we, re we recommend um, um, routine use of um, antivirals for up to two weeks postpartum. So it takes somewhere between two and four weeks for the risk to go back down would be my guess. 
And then I have a question for you that you sort of addressed a little bit, but uh, maybe to, uh, oh, actually, before I wrap things up, um, another question. Do you think the COVID pandemic and plans for inclusion of pregnant women in phase three trials will help shift systemic exclusion of women from vaccine trials for other pathogens? Great question. Yeah, that is a great question. Um, boy, I hope so. Um, I mean, we've been, we've been saying the same thing for decades now. I mean, we had the same issue with the Ebola vaccine. Women were excluded from the opportunity in, in areas of West Africa where Ebola was raging and they were doing you know, ring vaccination um, in people. Um, to keep them from a deadly Ebola virus, pregnant women were being excluded from clinical trials and from the opportunity to get vaccinated. And we all jumped up and down. And you know, for years, NIH has been saying that they're going to address this. Um, but I think there needs to be some pressure on the FDA as a regulatory agency and on manufacturers to say, we know it's a lot easier to exclude pregnant women, but we can't keep doing the same thing that we're doing. Um, so thanks for that question. And that actually sort of feeds into what my wrap up question was going to be a little bit you've, you know, you have had really the unique experience of working on so many very interesting and different um, uh, epidemics and pandemics, um, which all have very different effects on, um, on uh, women and infants. Are there any commonalities? I mean, you sort of mentioned it a little bit of it's, it, it's the individual pathogen each time. Are there any commonalities as you've, um, you know, researched uh, um, these pandemics and lived through them? Um, and there are things that we have learned. And then um, are there lessons we need to take forward, like um, the, the uh, inclusion of pregnant women uh, that you just mentioned? But are there other lessons that we could use to do better for our next pandemic, which we're not waiting for, but will inevitably happen. Yeah, so I agree with you. I think it's all about planning. And I think um, there's going to be another, you know, large, there are going to be continue to be epidemics. There's probably going to be another pandemic and um, there are going to be pregnant women involved. And so um, setting up systems now I think is really important. So for example, surveillance systems. So we were taught, we, it took us, you know, tens of hundreds of thousands of infections before we figured out that it was more severe in pregnant women because we didn't have surveillance systems in place to quickly gather that information. The WHO report that I mentioned that early on suggested there was no increased risk had under a hundred pregnant women, you know, several months into the, into the pandemic. And so I think just thinking about pregnancy issues and preparing and then properly um, funding um, uh, organizations to be able to study these issues is really important. Um, do you think that will happen as a result of this pandemic, if it hasn't in the last several? I, don't, I mean, I hope so. I don't know. I'm, uh, I, I'm, it's a strange time. I mean, um, you know, for the flu pandemic, we set up this surveillance system when I was still at the CDC. Um, and we jumped up and down and said it has to continue. And then, you know, funding was cut. People looked at other, you know, were interested in other things. And then two, two years after the pandemic, there was no um, pregnancy registry. Um, it was gone. And so Zika was the same thing. I mean, Zika, they had a nationwide surveillance system, but it didn't capture asymptomatic persons. Because why, why do you care about Zika? If you're asymptomatic, unless you know that it's associated with birth defects, then it becomes very important. So I think having a more, I think it gets back to strengthening the overall national surveillance systems for infectious diseases is going to be really important. And I think pregnancy needs to be an important component of that. Dr. Stevens, that's a new hand up, right? Yes, it is. <laughs> So Denise, I, one, uh, again, thank you for, uh, for the great talk and, and, and I, I do agree and there's a lot of discussion about, uh, as you're aware of at national levels about including pregnancy as a part of these trials. Uh, my question though is about monoclonals and, and you didn't mention monoclonals, but certainly there's new data even today about the, the effect of monoclonals and prevention uh, and wanted to get your comments about uh, monoclonals in pregnancy. I don't know the monoclonal um, literature that well, the studies that have come out. I do know that theoretically, um, monoclonals would not be something that you'd have 
huge concerns about using in pregnancy, um, given their mechanism of action and other um, therapies that we've used in pregnant women. Um, so I would hope that pregnant women would be included. Are pregnant women being included in any of the trials, do you know? I'm, I'm not aware that they have been, um, uh, again, it's probably like the vaccine trials where there are some pregnant women that get enrolled in these studies. It's a good question. This monoclonal studies are considerably smaller though, with only a few thousand as opposed to 30 or 40,000. So it's a, it's a, a good question, but uh, it is a pretty exciting uh, 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 look at prevention with monoclonals for COVID. And I, I missed a question on here, which I think um, is valuable for all of us. Do you have a spiel that you give to pregnant women who have hesitancy toward the vaccine to try and move them forward in that, that thinking? You know, I guess my, in counseling people, and I've also been trying to ask everybody, uh, I meet whether they're gonna get vaccinated or not if it's offered to them. Um, and I think the, um, the uh, woman who cleans our call rooms at Grady, who I've known for many years, um, uh, said it best. I said, are you gonna get vaccinated? And she said, ooh, I am so afraid of that vaccine. I don't like vaccines in general. And that's, that thing is some new vaccine. I'm really afraid. Um, and so she, and she paused and she said, but I'm more afraid of that COVID. And so I think, I think it's really important to talk to people about the risks and the benefits and there are often risks of doing nothing. And if you're in a position where you are exposed to COVID and you can't quarantine and everybody in your household can't quarantine, it's really um, important for them to understand that um, uh, there are risks of doing nothing and not getting vaccinated um, in the time of the pandemic. Um, the, um, I just thought of something else. Just, um, yeah, so I think it's important to sort of meet people where they, where they are. The other thing that people say as well, it's, you know, it's rushed and the vaccine was rushed and we don't know what it means in pregnancy. And I think it's really important to sort of remind people that we've been using a lot of vaccines in pregnancy for a long time. Um, and there are really very few instances where vaccines are not safe in pregnancy. Live vaccines um, in pregnancy are problematic. Um, and, um, uh, even the influenza vaccine, people don't realize what year was the first year that the Surgeon General in the US recommended that pregnant women get vaccinated for influenza? 1960. So we've been vaccinating women for a long time. Um, but anyway, yeah, there's a lot of overall vaccine hesitancy um, um, for flu and for other vaccines. Interestingly, I'll just say one more thing. We recommend a vaccination with flu and Tdap in pregnancy are the two recommended vaccines in pregnancy. And we see less hesitancy, and this is reflected nationally as well, for the Tdap vaccine, because women know less about the Tdap vaccine. They haven't heard about it, whereas there are a lot of myths and community concerns about the flu vaccine. So I was hoping the new COVID vaccines would sort of be more like Tdap and less like flu. That strikes me as, as hopeful, <laughs> but perhaps not likely. Um, any other questions before we wrap things up? Well, in the absence of that, thank you so much for giving us this hour of your time and uh, helping us um, reflect and uh, digest the information that's out there. This uh, has been terrific. Great, thanks for the opportunity.